Scud is a proud sponsor of the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler. Scud Ceramic Products has been manufacturing equipment for potters since 1953. Scud's reputation as a pioneer in innovative kiln design continues with the fourth generation of this family-owned business. Their Kilnmaster touchscreen controller offers a sleek, smartphone-like interface that is both intuitive and packed with powerful tools that allow potters to easily program, diagnose, and remotely monitor their kilns. With five dedicated kiln technicians on staff and the most comprehensive network of distributors across the globe, you can rest assured that Scut will be there for you before and after the sale. For more information on their line of kilns, visit scut.com. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns, and they have no plans of slowing down. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high-quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 396 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Susan Fagan about her work. But before we get to that, I wanted to report back from my time at Penland. And I've got to say, I so miss my students already, but I want to thank them for showing up and being a part of that educational process. We had a smooth workshop thanks to Susan, who is the clay coordinator at Penland. She did a great job managing student expectations as well as helping me keep everything together as we were soda firing and electric firing and doing all sorts of firings. So I wanted to thank her publicly for that. In this interview today with Susan, we talk about her work. She is a potter that uses collage methods in clay. We discuss how she does slip transfer, scraffito, and other patterning methods, and how she develops structure within active surface designs. If you'd like to see examples of her work, you can go to susanfaganceramics.com. Also wanted to mention that two of my fellow podcasters on the Brickyard Network have finished up their first seasons. I wanted to congratulate Angelique Viscarando LeBoy and Alex Anderson for finishing up their first season of Clay and Color, as well as Adam Chow for his first season of Trade Secret. So if you haven't listened to their shows already, check them out. And if you have been listening, send them a note on social media and thank them for doing that work. If you'd like to find out more about the Brickyard Network, you can do that at brickyardnetwork.org. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about early days. Like, how did you get into clay? What was your interest in clay? I always wanted to be an artist as a kid. You know, I always had that dream. And uh, my parents, you know, they never encouraged me nor discouraged me. So I went on to get be an art major in college at UNC Greensboro. And so you're required to take ceramics, not unlike at University of Florida. At that time, you had to take a clay class. 
and it was a figurative sculpting class. I didn't think I would like clay, but I liked clay. I'm not a good sculptor, but I enjoyed the immediacy of the clay. I hadn't thought about it. And then uh, I took a, the next semester I took a hand building class and I just somehow clicked making vessels. Like I loved this idea of a object that people could use, even though my hand built pots were very rudimentary. Still, I like that idea. And in retrospect, now looking back on my life, you know, my family, we had pottery around the house, like just vessels that uh, had come down through my parents' families, just, you know, knickknacks basically. So I guess I grew up always seeing pots and so it, it kind of resonated that I should start making pots, I guess. So I learned how to throw in like 1990. And uh, it just kind of made sense to me to do that. And then, of course, years later, discovering imagery on clay and decorating the clay, like really had it for me, you know, like I love that uh, that surface. So I guess I came into clay accidentally. But a lot of people do that. You take an elective and then you're like, oh, I love clay. Forget med school. I'm going to make pots. <laughs> Did you grow up in North Carolina? Well, I grew up in California. I'm from Los Angeles originally. But then when I was 11, my family moved to Atlanta. But my mom's from North Carolina. She grew up in North Carolina. And my dad's family, the Fagans, are from all over the Southeast. My dad worked for Lockheed Martin. So that's why my parents were in L.A. They were in Southern California from 1957 to 1982, something like that. And uh, anyway, so anyway, so I grew up, I guess, in Georgia, in, in the burbs of Atlanta, and my childhood, well, my teenage dream was to move to North Carolina because Atlanta's not really my home. And plus, like I say, my mom's from North Carolina. So I have family all over North Carolina and South Carolina. So I ended up at UNC Greensboro for college. I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia, oh, which no is kidding. like sometimes people would fly to Greensboro. It's close enough. It's the, the, the next closest bigger airport. Yeah, 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 yeah. Roanoke's nice. It's beautiful there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's like Asheville, but not as cool. <laughs> I would it say that's accurate. Yes. It looks the same. You know what I mean? It's like a nice valley town. Uh, the Fagans lived in Roanoke in the middle 50s, I think. Oh, okay. So the Fagans moved, lived all over the place. So how about that? That's so cool. Small world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you went to UNCG, who were the, your professors there? Um, my teacher was Setsuya Katani, who was still, I hope I pronounced his first name right, is Katani. He's still around. And uh, I've met a lot of people over the years that also studied with Katani here at Penland. And uh, Katani actually encouraged me to come to Penland. And I should also mention my great aunt was a student at Penland in the 50s. So I kind of known about Penland forever. So uh, anyway, he was my teacher. Yeah. At what point did you realize there was a North Carolina tradition of clay? I guess I figured that out at UNC Greensboro on my own, wanting to read more about pottery and finding, well, there was the Pillin Book of Ceramics that has Cynthia Bringle and Jane Pizer in it, but there were other books that I found, not the Turners and Burners book, but there's another one that's about North Carolina potters, that folk tradition. And then, um, so I didn't have a car when I went to college at Greensboro. My parents would come to drive me back and forth to Atlanta, you know, and then, uh, my dad was the one that would drive me around, right? And dad's like, well, you know, the Fagans lived in Star, North Carolina for a while. And my dad remembered as a little boy going to Seagrove and watching the Seagrove potters. And then my great uncle grew up in Seagrove. So it was like these stories from my dad about visiting Seagrove. So of course, you know, we had to go to Seagrove and visit. And so that's how I guess I got acquainted with that tradition, which is still very traditional. I think of that area, still that traditional folk tradition, which is really beautiful. Because when I think about your work, I don't think about it being a part of the North Carolina thing. No, it's not really, I guess. I don't know. I have a broader... Well, I'm not really from... I don't know. But yeah, it's not really that same folk tradition. But I would say this area of Western North Carolina is its own unique animal. Everybody's so different and unique. And one of the things I think about tradition as a whole, like as a bigger topic, is that sometimes it seeps into us without us knowing. And that was kind of the reason I was asking about the tradition is that I, I too, I went to Appalachian State. And so I started to, yeah, learn about all this mountain pottery tradition. And I, I don't think my pots look like that. But I definitely think it's like, informed the way I think about what a life as a potter is. Sure. Yes. And that's one of the advantages of Western North Carolina is you can see hundreds of potters and see hundreds of different ways of doing it. Right. And I do remember as a young person coming up here and being inspired by people like Cynthia Bringle and Gay Smith and uh, Susie Lindsay who make a living from making pots. I didn't know that was possible until I came here. And I'd say that's unique to North Carolina. I don't know. 
So you mentioned image on clay, like really got you. So when, when did you realize you wanted to go in that direction? So I came to Pinland. I took a class in uh, 1996, spring concentration with Matthew Metz and Linda Sikora. And I was very young, you know, I was still pretty much a beginning potter, just this, this sponge soaking it all in. And of course, Matt Metz, you know, is like Scrafito king and whatnot. So I remember playing around with Scrafito and I hadn't thought about imagery in that way, like decorating pots. Previous to that, it was like, um, I took a wood firing class. And then of course at UNCG, it was your regular content reduction. So it was, I didn't even think about imagery on clay back then. It was just, you glaze it, it's done. So I was so inspired by that because I've always liked doodling and drawing and making little cartoony things and always been interested in pattern actually. So that was when I realized, oh, this is what I should do. This is fun. It was a, it was a good moment. Well, before we get farther, you got to tell some stories about Matt and Linda as teachers, because that would have been one of those epic concentrations. It was an epic concentration. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, this was before Linda taught at Alfred. And I want to say she went away on a teaching interview in Colorado, maybe. And uh, while during the concentration, and I want to say she also went to University of Georgia for an interview, or there was something going on. And so she was away for a little bit. And so... Anyway, I just have memories of like us, quote unquote, like partying while Linda was away. <laughs> Basically, the music was turned up. We were just making pots. No <laughs> lesson plan. No, because Linda's very structured. Like this week, bowls. This week, cups. Next week, whatever. We just did whatever we wanted, listening to the music, not paying attention. And I'm sure when she came back, she was like, this is <laughs> yeah, not what the assignment. <laughs> this is horrible. Why are you doing this? <laughs> um, it was a fun, Pillow was very different back then, of course, uh, but I had a good time studying with them, you know, and I was really, I never really seen someone use a treadle wheel before. And of course, Linda uses a treadle wheel. So that was really inspiring. Never used Terra Sigillata before because that's what Matt uses for his black sige. It was a fun, it was a fun time. Yeah. And as I'm looking at you, I can see some Matt pots over your shoulder. Yes, <laughs> I do. I have a Matthew Metz and then the other black and well, there's a couple of mine up there too. Yeah. So the, the carving process that he does and a lot of the work that you do feels a little bit like woodblock printing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And as you got farther along, you started doing printing. That's right, so that's right. can you talk about sort of going from, I'm going to carve through a layer of slip to I'm going to put an image on the pot. Like how to talk about how you think about that in your working process. Well, I didn't try printmaking really till I became a, a course student at Penland. So that was after my class with Matt and Linda. The next spring, I came back and took a class with Matthew Corney or Matt Corney for the, another concentration. And that was more like how to put the image on the pot, like pushing out this area of your vessel. And that could be one decorative element or like carving out this other area it could be another element, like thinking about where to put the decoration on the pot. And uh, I would say Michael Corney's work is a lot like that. Those slip cast teapots, you know, purposefully the form and the image going together. And that's the first time I really thought about that. I think for me in Matt Linda's class, I was still a beginning thrower. So it's more like, oh, I worked so hard <laughs> to make the cylinder and then put the handle on and have the handle stay there. You know, it was too much about that. But with Michael's class, it was more opportunity to think about because I could throw a little bit better. So I think that's the first time that came. And that's still a challenge to this day. I think a lot of decorative potters still think about that. You know, even you. Totally. What's well, endless. Someone was talking about in, in the class recently that once you get into decoration, you're it's like a lifetime pursuit. It is. And it's, oh, I never get tired of it. It's so much fun. <laughs> yeah. So in, in the other room, we there's a lot of baskets that you've been making lately are, are, if they're not actual baskets with handles, oval forms. And you do a, a process that's a lot like collage, like you'll have different images or patterns or carving on specific parts of the pot. So can you talk about how you build the form first and then how you match the decoration to that form? Well, those oval pieces, well, first I have a bunch of slabs of clay. They're all slab built, of course. So and I can decorate my slabs. And then they're formed on a drape mold just to start off. And then I add like a foot or something. And then I flip them over and build them up on the sides. And it's, it is literally collage. It's a lot of slip and score is my life. That's all I do. I've worn out many a serrated rib tool, just scoring, but I kind of add, I'll like create a collaged strip of clay and attach that, or sometimes just add individual pieces. 
And those oval shapes I really like because there's a definite front and back. And that's how I view it. So the the pattern is more kind of arbitrary. Like I'll decorate my slab, not really thinking about it. And then I'll cut strips or cut pieces that just kind of look good at the time. Kind of like how quilting, I've never tried quilting. I think that's my next step. But like kind of a piecemeal kind of thing. And then I feel like once the vessel's more uh, leather hard to bone dry when I do this graffito part, I'm adding some decorative element that's going to tie it all together. Like that little scallop edge or that weird squiggly thing kind of somehow pulls it together kind of because you've got all this disparate imagery kind of. So when I'm working, I'm trying to be spontaneous. Like I try to work really fast and not think about it too much for this current body of work. And um, I also feel like uh, when I glaze the work on some of those vessels, there's like a black band around the top. Like I'll put that black glaze on the rim and that kind of holds it all together to kind of visually stop the pattern because they get really busy. My work is pretty busy, which is kind of interesting to me. There's a lot of visual stuff going on. Um, and I want to keep the, the user or the viewer looking all around the pot, kind of. And you mentioned with an oval, there's a front and back. There's inside, outside. There, you're also doing stuff on the bottom. So like if they pick things up, they could see that. That's the gift to the dishwasher. How do you manage color? Because you are sometimes using very bright colors in a small proportion beside sort of like, let's say you got 20% really bright slip or underglaze on something. And then 80% of a more subdued blacks, browns, grays, oh, sure. all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing the decoration on the slab, how do you balance that? Do you just like keep track in your head? You need a little orange to balance out this. <laughs> I, I Well, I do try to keep track of that a little bit because you're right. I want to have like the bright colors kind of balanced by these more subtle subdued colors kind of, you know, because that bright, that bright red underglaze looks so much better next to this subdued pale green or something like that. I do try to keep track of that. But of course, you know, with soda firing, the gift of soda firing is that sometimes the kiln will decide differently for me. <laughs> it will change that for me, which I actually kind of like. But yeah, I do try to keep track of that. But sometimes I forget, I'll be honest. <laughs> and uh, things don't quite work out. Oh, well. Well, one of the things I like about the collage idea, though, is that you'll have I don't know how to describe it, but you'll have sections of the slab that are predominantly negative space. So the clay's coming through. And then the slab beside it, that will be the figure ground will switch and you'll do the opposite, where it's primarily the foreground uh, sort of color base that's on there. So you said you put the pots together and then you scraffito back. But are you trying to make each little section look separate? Or are you trying, like, is unity the goal or is focal point the goal oh good question i would say focal point a little bit because i do want the pieces to look different and then i guess it's that glazing that helps draw it all together that 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 glazing on the on the border for example i do like that each individual piece has got something different for the viewer and the user yeah and i feel like your pots are the kind like if if someone has one of your pots it every year they'll discover something new like, oh, right. Like, oh, there's a different pattern on that section. Because if you turn your pot front to back, it's totally different. It's not a different form, but it's a very different pot. Even I notice things on the ones that I keep for myself. Like, oh, wow, I should remember to do that again. Of course, I never remember, you know. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. do you, this is a tangent, but do you keep the good ones or the bad ones? I keep the bad ones, believe it or not, uh, just because they're cracked or broken. And um, I'm too embarrassed to release them into the world. But I actually... I really should keep some of the good ones these days because um, the good ones are out there. I don't even know where they are. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> How do you photograph work that is that complex? Well, for me, I have my little phone that I could take individual photos. But then um, there's some, well, the, fortunately being around Pendleton, there's some really good object photographers that I can hire that have taken pictures of my work. And I kind of leave it to them to decide the lighting on that. And then it's just like, um, I usually ask for a lot of detail shots and I'll pick out the nicer pieces for that. Well, that's what I was thinking. Like if you were going to apply to an exhibition, you'd send like one shot in 45 detail. I know, but they only want like <laughs> two detail shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how it goes for me. Of course, I haven't applied for something in a long time, but that's that's usually how I end up doing it. 
See, this is smart. This is the way you deal with that so that problem is that you just don't apply to things anymore. Oh. <laughs> well, well, I know, but then you don't, but then you don't apply for things. You got to get out there. No, I, I I agree though. Like I I have I am a lazy applier. Like I have not put in applications for shows in a long time, and not. I mean, I think it's a good thing to just do as a practice almost. Like once a year, apply to Strictly Functional or any of the, you know, big exhibitions. Absolutely. But paperwork is the last thing I ever want to do. I hate paperwork. <laughs> I hate it. I, I hear you on that one. Yeah. So one of the things you do is you use text in work. Can you talk about how you think about text flat, you know, like two-dimensional text, but then how you make put that in as a pattern? Because it also, it almost becomes abstract. It's not like... When I often when I'm looking at your pots, I can't necessarily read what it's saying. Right, right, right. Well, I'm thinking about it as pattern. It's not meant to be illegible, of course. And um, hmm, how did that happen? Well, I got interested in putting text on the on the clay because uh, I don't journal so much now, but I used to be really into journaling and letter writing and noticing people's handwriting, like people with beautiful handwriting, and it's kind of a lost art cursive writing. Even I don't write in cursive anymore. So I am thinking about that as that, that pattern, that energy. Um, you, I can, I can, on the Xerox machine, I can blow it up or make it smaller and just make that just an interesting abstracted pattern. And, um, it has good, it has like a vibrancy and an energy to it. So, and plus it just, it looks good on the pots, I think, but a lot of people write on pots. I'm thinking those wonderful, uh, Islamic pots with the beautiful calligraphy and whatnot. There's a tradition in that that I really enjoy. What types of text do you take? Well, the text I'm printing right now is from letters that my dad wrote to me uh, from when I was in college, I guess. And some of them are typewritten. So I have this, this the old-fashioned typewriter text. And then, of course, letters that people have written to me that had really nice handwriting. And I just thought, oh, this is kind of good. So I'm that's what I'm using. I'm trying to find text that's personal to me and sort of resonates my story. It's, it's not my own handwriting. I love the idea that, that like a younger listener might be listening to us and go like a letter, like a handwritten letter. Handwritten letters. People that still do so it, old. but not many people <laughs> do. I know. And, uh, I don't know. I love that. You know, I grew up in a family of letter writers because my parents lived out in California and all my dad's relatives lived in Virginia and North Carolina, South Carolina. And uh, the Fagans traveled around a whole bunch. My dad was in the military for a number of years, and they just wrote letters back and forth to each other. And my dad wrote letters to me all the time, too, even though I was just six hours away in Greensboro. So that's, and I, of course, anyway, that's, that's sort of the personal connection to that writing is that that's a connection with people out there and uh, speaking to the world, kind of, I guess. Yeah. I feel like cursive has a very romantic quality, not necessarily that like what your dad was writing was romantic, mm -hmm. but just the idea of like a, like a lovely fantasy of that, sure, yes. that script, you know? And I see that in movies. A lot of times movies, cursive is a signifier of some sort of nostalgia or romance. Oh, definitely. So how do you think about era of imagery? So like the text is from now, or I guess like 10 years ago, but then we were looking at a pattern on a pot that was from an ornament book, you know, that's probably a hundred years old. Oh, right. You know, so how do you think about like, you're kind of collaging across time and space. Oh, wow. That's a great, oh, I hadn't noticed that. That's awesome. I don't know. I think that, that, well, thinking about writing, the concept of writing and communicating and narrating a story and touching another or communicating with another human being across the miles or whatever is timeless like that. No doubt people that wore garments with that pattern or had that pattern on their wallpaper were longing for people far away or were writing correspondence to their, to their other family member or something. So maybe there's a timeless connection between all of that. But I think you might also agree in the world of ceramic decorating, it's all been done before and so we do have that, priv well, I don't want to say privilege, but we do have that curse, I don't know, of like referencing historic imagery and things. I guess there's, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Do you give yourself any boundaries from what you'll draw from? Or is that more just visual interest? Like if it's visually looks good, that then it will be incorporated? I guess visual, because I don't want to go too far out of my own 
realm here in the Southeast. Like I am inspired by Uribe pots from Japan, but I've known about those. Well, I learned about those at UNC Greensboro, but I don't want to get too, I don't want to spread out because I may not be educated enough or knowledgeable enough about that culture to be able to responsibly appropriate those ideas maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus also, I think taking from my world also as a layer of my personal expression in that work too, like things that appeal to me. Um, I mean, I do get a lot of inspiration from the natural world, even though I don't draw flowers and leaves on my pots per se. I do think about that pattern of like leaves that um, just looking out my window at all these trees, like this overall blur of color and leaves. Yeah, and, and we're in Spruce Pine, and so you're never far from a mountain here. That's you're right. You're either on a mountain or you're looking at a mountain. <laughs> you know, and it's like there's a compression of space up in the mountains that I, I don't know how I forgot it. I grew up in the same mountains, like four hours north. You know, it's it's weird that I forgot. But I live in New Jersey where it's totally flat now. But I think about in your work, there's often a compression of space as well. That's true. You know, true. like one pattern, let's say if you're looking at an oval, the outside pattern the rhythm or density of that pattern will be so similar to the front or the inside that it compresses the space. So how do you think about accentuating form versus camouflaging form? Mm, mm, I think right now I'm into the whole camouflaging of form because it's all this barrage, this uh, chaos of pattern and color, which you're right, is sort of reflective for me. Like, you, well, you lived in Montana for a while, so it's way open. Like, I don't know how I would, <laughs> I can't imagine living in an open space like that. Yeah, well, my forms are pretty simple. Like, I feel like my shapes are pretty rudimentary compared to, like, well, like Mark Ferris, for example, who has these really beautiful, elegant, complex forms. My work's the opposite of that. And I really am more interested in that accentuated, patterned, vibrant surface. The form itself is pretty quiet. Do you ever feel like not decorating? Yes, I have thought about that. How weird would that be? (laughs) I've thought about that, actually. Just like making undecorated work it would still be the collage pots but it would be just undecorated and that would work well i asked because i heard linda sakura give a lecture one time and she talked about how she she had been making that sunside like the the uh drippy runny glaze work for i don't know 10 years some a while and she decided that she just wanted to see what the white pot looked like oh wow and when i when she said that i thought like that was a novel idea because once I started decorating, I cannot stop. Like, it's almost like a compulsive action. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I celebrate my OCD every day. <laughs> yes. Stacking bricks, drawing all over things. But, you know, I think that's a good exercise because I remember when I was in grad school at UF, Linda Arbuckle told me the same thing. Susan, why not just make something naked, undecorated, <laughs> and see what you think about it? I think that's a good exercise to really look at your form. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfeldcollection.com. This episode is also sponsored by the Pocosin Art School of Fine Craft. Pocosin is a full-service art center in Columbia, North Carolina, offering interactive online workshops as well as in-person workshops in clay, wood, and metals. To celebrate the start of their workshop season, Pocosin is giving away an online workshop to one lucky maker. Simply subscribe to their newsletter and mention the Red Clay Rambler in the Where Did You Hear About Pocosin line before December the 20th. To enter the giveaway and learn more about these opportunities, visit Pocosin Arts. I'm always interested when people are self-aware, and Linda is an, is an example as a maker and as a person. She is very self-aware, and I think that's what makes her a great teacher. Absolutely. You know, is that she kind of knows the right time to rib you and the right time to pat you on the back. Absolutely. I agree with you on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you talk about that that influence uh, of being at UF? Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, what a privilege to have studied with Linda Arbuckle and to have been at UF. Uh, you know, you don't there's I don't there's very few programs that have such wonderful vessel-oriented program or 
emphasis right now. Well, let's see. It was a little intimidating too, right? Because you're with Linda, this master decorator and master potter, and here I am. Ah. <laughs> mm, but I overcame that fear, I guess. And um, now that I think about it, that might explain how these pots got so vibrant and so overly patterned was just me just like pouring everything into these vessels, like everything I knew at that time, graffito, slip transfer, all that stuff, and hoping to get something right, <laughs> you know? Um and I, I also, you might agree, Linda's just a genius, I think. I was absorbing so much information from her about the history of ceramics and, um, uh, you know, not being afraid to do research and go out on my own and learn how to screen print on clay on my own and really um, explore more hand-built forms. Like, I hadn't really thought about hand-building until I went to UF. So that was a big eye-opener for me. Linda loaned me some plastic vessels that I poured plaster into to make some drape molds. So that's how all that got started. I wouldn't have thought about it had it not been for that influence. And then, uh, of course, you can relate as a teacher yourself, just watching Linda teach and how she is so organized and um, uh, on it and just knows when to push you and when to compliment you. So those are all good lessons. Yeah, I feel like I'm still living up to that legacy. <laughs> oh, we all are. I mean, we'll never be, we'll never be as great, but we can, we can be ourselves and, uh, aspire to that. Yeah. Well, that's, what's funny is like, I think if I said, Linda, I want to be like you, she'd be like, ah, don't, don't try to do that. Just exactly. Be yourself. She would totally say that. <laughs> that's so right. But in, in doing that, I think she has a lot of really loyal students, you know, that, that really think fondly of their time with her. And also just, she still has the best eye of anyone that I've ever met mm -hmm. as an artist. Absolutely. You know, like she would walk past the studio and stick her head in and be like, if that rim was twice as thick, the pot would be better. You know, like she'd say stuff That's like that. That's exactly right. <laughs> and you, she's always right. Always right. Not unlike Cynthia Bringle. She's always right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let, let's, let's transfer up to Pinland when you came, you finished grad school and became the coordinator here. Right. So I came to be, so I finished grad school in 2007 and came here to be, I was interim clay coordinator for a bit and then was hired as the official clay coordinator. But, um, but I was at Pinland in the nineties too, was well, as a concentration student and then as a course student, which is actually how I met Linda Arbuckle was when I was a course student. Anyway, so I came to be back to Pinland and it was so great to be back at home, so to speak here at this school. And, um, it's really wonderful. There's, so much energy and excitement on campus. The students are there. Everyone's upbeat. The teachers are there. And so to this day, it's still an inspiring place to see. I love watching people work and how people process things and their own processes and how, how people teach, like even watching how you teach compared to how um, other people teach. You know, it's really, it's never a dull moment. But it's, it's great to be here. I'm not, I'm still having fun on this job. I'm still having a good time. You've managed to do it longer. I think you're the longest coordinator of any studio, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so it's four, is it how many years? Uh, let's see. I started in 2007. Um, it's now 2021. 14 years. 14 years. Oh my gosh. Wow. Amazing. Well, when I was a core student, we went through, I think, five coordinators or four clay coordinators in the whole two years I was here. Things were much different back then. The jobs were all seasonal and stuff like that. But um it's kind of great to be here for a while because it's good for the studio, right? There's a lot of continuity that I can ensure happens and a lot of continuation between sessions and between years, I think, that I guess is good. Well, one of the things about being any staff member is that energy people are sucking energy out of you all the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. That is so true. Like we come, I come to you with questions. Students have questions for you, but also the rest of the staff have questions for you. How do you energetically balance like being able to be not depleted like especially in the summer because it's how nine sessions in a row or however many sessions there are in a row oh it's it's seven it's seven sessions seven okay. and there's two clay workshops so technically it's 14 workshops in three months but i well i, I kind of love it because the energy well once again is super exciting right people you know sometimes people are discovering clay for the first time or they've never seen wood firing before so i love that naivete it makes me happy and it reminds me of why I like clay but um I have to yeah I have to, I have to distance myself like um, when I come home I come home and I'm in my little studio and fortunately my responsibility is just the clay studio so I can kind of shut off when I come back I don't have to worry about greater pictures I guess 
uh, and I have my clay work. That's a real, I don't want to say stress reliever, but it's a time occupier. I don't know. I can kind of get lost in my own pieces and think about like making new screens, for example. A lot of my transfers are screen printed, which is great, but then I get tired of printing the same thing over and over again. So thinking of new images. Yeah, but I do like that energy. I, that in, that energy really drives me, or the, the energy of the students, I think. You seem to be optimistic. You were, I would say, relentlessly optimistic. <laughs> oh, it's part of being a Sagittarius. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me more about this, because one of the things I've noticed is that a success is good information and a failure is good information. Like you, you're not, so far you have not mentioned good or bad to any of my students. Like oh, you don't frame it in that way. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so people might be making huge mistakes and you're not upset by it. You're just like, oh, that's good. You learned that. <laughs> well, sure. We all learn from our mistakes, right? <laughs> Sometimes maybe, isn't there a cliched saying about your success is your best failure or something like that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe Colonel Sanders said that. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, Yeah, well, I do think just from my own experience, when I was younger, I was very critical of my own work. And like, really, as I've gotten older, I've learned to give myself a little bit more credit and be like, I'm still working hard. I'm making lots of mistakes and not making the best pods, but at least I'm making something and I'm really um, uh, trying to express myself, trying to validate that inner energy, trying to get rid of that inner critic, I guess. So a lot of that is me trying to well, I haven't taught clay in a long time, but um, when I've taught, well, when I taught at UF and then in the few times I've taught since then, you do want to encourage your students, even though they're making horrible mistakes and not the best work, you want them to keep pushing forward, I guess. So maybe I'm, I've been applying that to myself lately. I'm just an optimistic person, I guess. Well, I think there's something about that that you te- you kind of... St- I think that's a se- a secret. You just gave us a secret, which is that you step outside of yourself and mm-hmm. give yourself compassion and space to grow. I think that's important as a human being just in general, even if you're not an artist. And that's something that I learned as I've gotten older. I'm not that old, but you know what I mean? Like as I have matured, <laughs> I have learned this. Yes. Mm-hmm. So in this community, there are so many good makers. Like we can drive 10 minutes in oh, yeah. any direction. How much interaction do you have in terms of like artist to artist, um, like either asking for t- critiques or feedback? Like, is there any dynamic with anyone that's up here like that? Or is it more an internal process? Of just- it's more of an internal process. I mean, I'm sure if I like, you know, well, I'm sure if I called somebody up, like, like I'm sure Cynthia could give me all kinds of advice on work if I wanted it. And she would be open to doing that because, but, uh, it's more of an internal thing right now, but you know, it is great because I can see what people are making. Like, um, like for example, every year at the Potter's Market in October, like it's me and like, I think we're up to 17 other artists now. I forget how many people are on our membership, but it's great when we're setting up the show to look at people's work and rip off ideas. <laughs> well, and just also think, well, I need to work on my handles more or, well, I need to like think about my spouts or just things like that that keep you, uh, keep me inspired, you know, to keep moving forward. And, um, you know, I can also just pop over to Teresa's studio and see her latest things and be like, Oh, I want to try this technique. So that ne- it never gets boring. I'm really fortunate that I'm not like back in Atlanta, for example, I would, it would be totally different. Like I wouldn't, first of all, I had to drive in Atlanta. Who wants to drive in Atlanta? Right. But here <laughs> you could just drive someplace and you're right there. So that that is inspiring and quite a luxury to have that. Yeah, and it seems like there's a lot of camaraderie up here. I haven't right. seen a lot of competition. I was going to say, it's not competitive because uh, I don't have that much experience in the Seagrove area, but I think it is more of a competition down there, whereas up here it's much more supportive. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how that came about. Most people ended up in this area because of Pinland, of course. So... Um, it's just a different vibe. Like we're not in Seagrove. It's the Owen family that's been making pots for generations. Whereas up here, it's just like, you know, you're a one-off kind of, so to speak. So I think maybe that has made people more, more friendly to each other. Like I'm on pretty good terms with just about everybody. I mean, I don't want to brag or anything. (laughs) I'm on terms with everybody, you know, give or take. Well, I wonder what it would be like if you weren't. Like if you had like a oh my like gosh to be on enemy. Cynthia's bad side, you you don't want to go there. Don't want to go there. No, no, no. 
Well, well, let's talk about Cynthia Bringle because she is like such an icon in this oh, area. Totally. <laughs> I mean, she seems pretty accessible at all times. Like, what is it like to live up here? Oh, it's great living up here. Well, she is. She loves it when people come to her studio to visit. She really enjoys that, and um, she loves to answer any question you might have. And she can give you an answer to anything from raccoon firing to wood firing to whatever you want. Because she's done it all before, and she's very generous with her information. And she's got all kinds of little tricks and hacks and things, you know? And I love that. Um, I think it's really fun. Plus, she's lived here, uh, well, 50 years or so. So she knows everything about the area. So what a wonderful resource. And I'm what a great... It's fun to go to her house and just visit and hang out and listen to her talk. So that's great. Um, you know, but I will say I'm really fortunate to live in the Pinland bubble. You know, Mitchell County is pretty, you know, white people, very, uh, homogenous, very, dare I say, Protestant, you know what I mean? <laughs> like very, uh, conservative, I guess is the right word. And, um, people, you know, Pinland people, some people don't really like Pinland, you know, it's like, uh, different people, you know, uh, it's the Pinland school of witchcraft, right? You know what I mean? Oh. Well, that kind of, there's always that mystique, you know, which is totally untrue. There are no witches at Pinland, all right? <laughs> I just want to let you know, we're all, there are no witches. But uh, so um, going out into the community, I think, well, by now people know, I, like when I go to the hardware store, they all know I work at Pinland. But um, it's got to be hard for people of color that come to Pinland to go to town, to Spruce Pine, to get potato chips or snacks and ingles and be the only black person in the store. So uh, I, I'm trying to... Uh, Anyway, that's sort of where I live. So I just kind of stick with my Pinland friends, my Pinland world, you know, and that's that's a good thing. Well, I feel like this area, too, is it's it's a certain type of conservatism. I mean, it's politically conservative, but it's often like I'm going to protect my family and my family's going to be around this mountain for five generations. Right. That's you know? right. And where I'm from in Virginia, those mountains, same way. It's like very much it's not that you can't be a part of of the family. It's just that like th our family has been here forever. And if you're not from here, you're always kind of an outsider a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Although I will say, you know, uh, Pinland has a huge presence in the public schools, like the Pinland community collaborations. I think every fourth grader and every 11th, 11th grader comes to Pinland to do a project with, uh, our wonderful teaching artists at Pinland. And then we have our big community day event once a year where, Anybody can come to Pinland and make pots for a day. So, I mean, there's a lot of local people that love Pinland, too, because they understand that art touches their lives and that making makes a difference, kind of. So I'm not, it's not totally like everybody is that way. But you're absolutely right, because we're all outsiders. Like, I didn't grow up in the mountains, you know, and uh, most of the clay people, well, well, Cynthia's from Memphis, but still, she's an outsider, too, if you think about it. She didn't grow up here. Yeah, good point. Well, I, w I wonder about like hospitality in this this area. Like artist hospitality is come on over. We're gonna have a potluck. Oh, sure. Like that's the way we do it. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> in clay, and then mountain hospitality is a little bit like that. But it's also if you come on my land, I'm gonna shoot you. Right. So exactly. There's a little more of that vibe. There's a little more of that. <laughs> you know, make sure you wait because it is hunting season. And uh, come to our church. Come to our church. But then I don't want to go to your church. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> right. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're right. Part of the economy here is mining. And when we were sitting down for the interview, you talked about that, that like the mine is basically across the valley. It, it is. Yeah. In fact, I live next door to the Quartz Corporation. The, the, the mine road is right there, right next door to my property. And then right across the way is one of the entrances to one of the Quartz Corporation mines. And so the Spruce Pine Mining Corridor is, in this area it produces like the most purest form of silicate in the world. So your iPhone, my iPhone, has silica in it from spruce pine, no doubt. Wow. Or from this area, I should say. So that's uh, another amazing coincidence, you know, that uh, I live next door to Feldspar mine. But I'm not going to jump the fence and get you Feldspar rocks. <laughs> I don't want to get shot. Yeah. You know, too risky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you feel like as a community member, how do you look at these corporations? Like, do you feel like they're just extracting value out of the community or do you feel like they're mm. providing jobs like is it a overall plus or minus that they're basically cutting away the mountain gosh you know i need to get more into this i know that uh uniman mine quartz corporation um vulcan they're like big employers in this area like a lot of people work there and make their livelihood 
I think the second employer is the public schools and then the regional hospital that's in Spruce Pine. So a lot of people depend on the mines for their living. But this mine next door to me is a strip mine. When you drove over here, you probably saw just rows and rows and rows of just raw. Well, this well the waste products get dumped here. There's a lot of waste. And then if you drive the other direction, you can see where they're chopping down the mountain. It's pretty bad, I guess. Yeah, these are things I got to think about. And then also, you know, these corporations, they're making a lot of money. And Mitchell County is one of the poorest counties in North Carolina. So there's that disparity as well. Like who's, is Bruce Pine, I mean, it's the biggest employer here, but what else are these corporations giving back to our community? And of course that affects Pinland too, because Pinland's helping with art programs in the public schools. This is, these are all good questions. Yeah. And I mean, I would love to hear you know, obviously not a question for artists, but more for like the local politicians is how do you think about this? Like, do you think about rate, if you raise taxes 1% on that corporation, you could pay for so many public programs. But if you do that, like, how is that going to change the relationship? Because I I always kind of think the big corporations are not a good thing. But then also if they weren't here what would people, I mean, poverty has been in these mountains as long as the mountains have been here. <laughs> yes, that is so true. Well, well let's bring it back to, to Pinland. Um, part of your job is to help people sort of transition through the Pinland experience. So can you talk about what you think the Pinland experience is? Oh, the Pinland experience <laughs> is what we're all selling. Yes. <laughs> well, the Pinland experience for me is uh, coming to this remote location and then there's nothing to do but like focus on whatever media you've chosen glass clay whatever and like um learn some skills from your teacher right you learn how to throw or how to make good handles or whatever and like on your own you have all this unlimited time to try it out to discover like to try everything and then discover that you can do it that you can make these things like for me like I never really thought of myself as an artist like a real artist until I came to be a course student and then people kept I I felt like an artist so that's part of the Pinland experience is that you feel like you have the confidence to go home and try to make pots on your own or to go back to your college and try this technique and be successful at it so there's that there's also that um okay so that's one experience but also it's this group unity this group identity that you take on that like um, you're part of this wonderful craft making tradition, which is more than just yourself. So like being like your students right now, they're in that classroom with their classmates. They've never met before, but they've had this incredible bond, right? They've been in, the, this, in that classroom for six weeks now, making work, firing kilns together, learning side by side. They're going to be friends forever. You know, well, let's hope <laughs> we don't know, but that's part of the Pillin experience too, is that you develop this peer group and you've got this common bond and, um, uh, so that's what we're looking for. And then also, what a luxury to not have to cook your meals and to not have to, you can just walk to class and you're on this lovely, gorgeous mountain with beautiful views and there's no, you know, there's no distractions. That's also part of the Pillin experience, that retreat-like experience. Well, to wrap up, can you leave your website and social media so people could get in right. touch? Right. Well, my website is susanfaganceramics.com. That's ceramics, plural. And um, and then my Instagram handle is just my name, Susan Fagan. And that's F like Frank, E-A-G-I-N. That's my name. Yeah. That's what I got. We should plug Crafting the Future too. Can you describe what that is and how that is interacting with Sure, Pinland? sure, sure. Well, Crafting the Future is this, uh, I guess, foundation that was started by some Pinland folks, um, Annie Evelyn, who was a resident artist at that time, and uh, some uh, Corey Pemberton, who was a core student at the time. And uh, it's a little uh, foundation that raises money to send uh, young people of color to uh, craft schools like Pinland, Haystack, Aramont, places like that for a workshop. And you can join up. You can go to the website, craftingthefuture.org, and you can buy a membership. And the membership start at $25. It's super affordable. And all that money goes towards these scholarships at these various schools. And if I'm not mistaken, on the website is information about local – there's a local Pinland chapter – but maybe in your community where you live, you can start your own chapter and raise money uh, to send people to, to schools and whatnot. So we haven't done a fundraiser recently. We had a craft-a-thon a few months ago where in a 12-hour period you had to make an object, and those objects were raffled off to raise money. That was super fun. 
and uh, there might be more things in the future coming up. So yeah, lots of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. I'm happy to be part of that group. Well, thanks for doing the interview. And also just thanks for the help. Like it is so easy to teach here. Oh, well, that makes me feel good. I want it to be easy. It's hard teaching at Pinland. You're on, you're on all the time. You know, you're there 24 seven, you know, you can't really leave. I mean, you can leave, but you can't leave. (laughs) And, uh, lots of, lots of firings going on right now. It's super exciting to see what's happening in the studio. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, thanks for talking to me too. That's really nice. I'd like to thank Susan for taking the time to do this interview. It was a pleasure to spend some time with her when I was down in North Carolina. Wanted to take a minute and thank the sponsors for today's show. I'd like to thank Scut Ceramic Products, Amico Brent, the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art, and the Pocosin Art School of Fine Craft for their support in making this podcast possible. If you're interested or know an organization that's interested in sponsoring an episode on the Brickyard Network, you can get in touch with us at brickyardnetwork.org slash contact. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, Or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.